this section for network streams. Make sure you take, so what I'm going to do, okay, so what I'm going to do in this demo is I'm going to walk through the solution for exercise 6.3, network streams. So if you haven't looked at the module and the slides that are associated with this section for network streams, make sure you take a look at that right before this, since uh, a lot of this stuff is talked about in the slides. So let's go ahead and open up NS Writer. Notice that it's on our RT target. Let's go to the block diagram, which looks very similar to what we saw on the slides. Okay. So here we're going to initialize some some values here. Well, let's jump into the code for the network stream. So here we're creating a network stream. The data type is going to be a double precision number, and we're going to have a writer name here called my writer. Okay, and we have 10,000 elements for our writer buffer size. Okay. So in the in the deterministic loop, we're going to be generating some data. And then we're also monitoring a network published shared variable called stop generation, which is going to come from our host. Okay. So here in our non-deterministic loop, what we're going to do is we're going to get the data that was written down here. And then we're going to take that data and we're going to write it over the network using network streams. And in this case, because we wanted buffer data, that's why we're using network streams. So we're going to be doing that. Okay. So when we run this VI, the first thing that's going to happen is it's going to sit here and create this writer endpoint, and it's going to wait for a reader endpoint to connect to it. Okay. When we finish running this VI, it's going to go over here to flush stream, and that it's going to exit this writer loop, and at the flush stream, it's going to make sure that all those elements get flushed and sent up to our reader for our reader to go ahead and finish reading also. And once the reader has received all these elements and read them, it's going to finish execution of this flush stream and allow data flow to continue, and it's going to destroy this endpoint. Okay. So let me go ahead and close this one. And let's go to our NS reader. Okay. So let's go ahead and look at the block diagram here. Notice that one of the first things we're going to do is we're going to create the network stream reader and we're going to give it a name, my reader, and configure the buffer size. And we're also going to give it a writer URL that we want the reader to connect to. Okay. So here we're just going to keep reading elements from the stream. And then at some point we're going to hit the stop button, which stops the generation on our R2 target, which is also going to which is also going to cause our writer to flush the data and send it back up to the, the host. Okay? And then at that point, it's going to finish reading all the elements. And then on the writer end, it's going to destroy the endpoint, which is going to cause an error to come out of here. And then exit this loop and also destroy the endpoint up here on the reader. Okay? So if this is confusing, remember to go back to, to the to the slide module. And in the slide module there is a this exact block diagram is shown there and there's there's number one, two, three, four, five, six, and we walk through the order of what's going on. Okay. So let me close this and let me run my writer, which is going to be running on our RT target. Okay, so notice the art writer is on the RT target. Let me run this. It's going to download. And notice nothing is happening, right? So if we go to the block diagram, remember what we saw was it was creating the writer endpoint, and it was just waiting for a reader endpoint to connect to it. Okay? So let's move this down here. Now uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run the reader. Okay? Notice that I've given the writer URL for this reader endpoint to connect to. Once the connection has been established, we're going to be able to actually get some data back. Okay? So let's go ahead and run this. And notice now that the connection has been established, we're able to get buffered data getting transferred from the writer to the reader. Okay, so this is happening over the network. This is happening on my RT target, and this is being read on my host computer. Okay? So now I'm going to stop this. So when I click stop, this is going to stop generation on this side. And um, the code that we have on the RT target 
essentially what that's going to do is it's going to stop generation over here and flush the data to my reader. Okay, so I'm going to click, click stop. So notice that the the data has been uh, stopped generating from the RT uh, target, which is the writer. It's flushed the data back up to here, and at the at this point, once we finish reading all the data on the reader side, it went down here and executed the destroy stream function. Once it destroyed the stream on the writer end, up here on the reader end, that caused an error. And that's why we got that dialog. So if we go to the block diagram real quick, when we destroyed it on the bottom end, on the writer end, it caused an error to come out of here, which also caused us to destroy the stream endpoint on the reader side. And then because we have a simple error handler VI there, that error popped up on our screen like we just saw. Okay, so this is just an example of the plot diagrams that you saw in the slides associated with this exercise. In the previous section, we transferred buffered data over the network using a network stream. By the end of this module, you will be able to use standard protocols for network communication. Okay, so let's talk about how to communicate over the network with standard protocols. So first, let's talk about the use case. So sometimes you'll need to communicate with hardware or software that does not support LabVIEW, and this hardware and software uh, may, may support a standard protocol. So for instance, you might have a completed application uh, on your computer that you need to communicate with, and that uses a standard protocol, like, uh, like TCP or UDP. Or you might have another device on the network that, that communicates um, data using TCP, and maybe it also accepts commands using TCP. Sometimes using a standard protocol may even be the easiest solution. For example, if you had an application where you needed to implement a broadcast model, so for example, you just need to put data out there on the network, and you don't care about knowing whether the receivers received it, but you just want to put the data out there and whoever wants to listen to it can. Uh, well, that can be implemented easily using the UDP protocol. So some examples of standard protocols uh, that other software or hardware might use is one, TCP, that's a very, very common one, and that stands for Transmission Control Protocol. Another one is UDP, which stands for User Datagram Protocol, and also Serial. So you might need to connect to some serial devices and send them commands and receive data back from those as well. Okay, so let's talk about TCP. So TCP is a very common protocol that's used over the network, and some of the advantages of TCP is built into that protocol, there's ordered data transfer, there's a retransmission of lost data if it didn't get to the uh, receiver side. It's connection-based, so the writer and the reader are going to have an established connection. Also, um, built into the protocol, it guarantees error-free data transfer. So it's, it's a very, it's very uh, good protocol for reliable communication. Like other forms of network communication, it's going to be non-deterministic since there's things on the network that could possibly slow it down. So make sure you don't use TCB functions inside a deterministic loop. So here on the slide, you see a couple of examples of TCP VIs and functions. Notice um, you, you, you would start the connection with a TCP open connection or a TCP listen, depending if you're the server or client. You can do TCP reads, TCP writes to, to, to send um, um, string data back and forth. So if you want a demo of how these functions work, you can always go to the example finder. So just go to help um, NI example finder and then you can go to this location that you see on the slide, and you can take a look at an example of, um, of TCP communication. So there's examples with uh, a single client and a single server. There's ones with multiple clients with the server. So uh, feel free to browse that, and you can also read up more about it in the LabVIEW Hub. So if you need to implement TCP communication, make sure you learn how to deal with common challenges and implement TCP communication successfully. So some, some of the challenges uh, that that we talk about in other resources include trying to read and write metadata along with uh, your data. So if you want more information about some, some of these best practices, you can refer to one of the following. So one is uh, the networks communication section that's in the Compact Rio Developers Guide. So you can download that for free from NI.com or it's included in your exercises folder as well. You can also refer to the LabVIEW Real-Time 2 course. Now let's talk about UDP communication. So UDP stands for User Datagram Protocol, and this protocol is not connection-based, so that's a little bit different from uh, TCP. One of the, some of the advantages of UDP is there's very little overhead 
Um, however, you cannot verify the receipt of data. So one way that a lot of people use UDP is to broadcast data. So let, let, let's say you have an application and you just and it's collecting data and it just wants to broadcast that over the network. And then at that point, other people can try to listen and, and take a look at that data. One analogy would be this is more like a radio. So a radio station would broadcast uh, the, 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 the music that's being played on the radio station and then it doesn't know how many people are listening, but uh, other people can go ahead and listen to that data over, over the air as well. Okay, so that's kind of a good analogy for UDP. Again, UDP communication is non-deterministic since it's um, going out over the network. So don't place any of these UDP functions inside a deterministic loop. Okay, so let's talk about um, a couple of these network communication methods that we talked about in this past lesson and just go over them and, and let's have a quick review and comparison. Okay, so let's take a look at that first row. So network published shared variables. What is that used for? The common use case is when you want to transfer latest data over the network. So uh, if you want to communicate latest data between your RT target and your host VI, like the most current set point, for example. You can actually use these in a deterministic loop without uh, affecting the determinism of the loop if you enable the RT FIFO of that network published shared variable. So the data transfer itself is, is not deterministic. Um, so you, you can't guarantee that the data gets from the, the target and gets updated on the host deterministically just because that actual communication is being done over the network. However, um, like I said previously, you can put this safely inside a deterministic loop without um, making that deterministic loop undeterministic. One advantage of this method is it's very easy to use. You just create your network public shared variable, um, and then you configure it to only show the latest value, and then you can drag it from your project into your BIs. And the caveat of this one is it's live view only. So it's, it's going from like a live view RT target to a live view BI on your host computer. The next protocol that we talked about was network streams. So the common use case for this was data streaming. So uh, the network streams were, were made so you can do buffered transfer between your RT target and your host. So the speeds here are going to be faster because uh, we're, we're, we're streaming data over the network. There is a little bit of overhead on the network streams, but that overhead is what's maintaining that connection for you. So it's, it's very easy to program uh, with, with the built-in functions of network streams. So it's a set of functions that's built for data streaming. It, it, it takes care of a lot of the connections and stuff. We saw that with the writer endpoint and the reader endpoint establishing the connection. Pretty easy to use. So these functions are not deterministic, so you don't want to place them in any deterministic loops. And the data transfer itself is not deterministic either because um, it has to actually go over the network. And the caveat for this one is also that it is live view only. So um, for example, you're going from RTVI, which is written in live view, to a application on your host computer that is also written in live view. Then lastly, we've talked about standard protocols. So as you can see, we here we have here TCP and UDP. TCP is made more for data streaming. Uh, UDP it is made for broadcasting latest value. So both of these are going to be very fast. Both of these don't belong in a deterministic loop because they're non-deterministic. And the data transfer, again, is not going to be deterministic. Uh, the advantages here are they're, they're standard protocols, so they, they might be used by several um, third-party devices. Also, they're going to have high transfer rates. So some caveats. Um, so both of them, they're going to use string data. So the, the inputs and the output terminals of the TCP and UDP functions, if you're trying to write or read data, are going to be um, a string data type. So you'll have to make sure, if you're not using strings, you have to convert your data into a string data type. And then uh, with UDP, remember the caveat there is that it is lossy. Um, there's, there's no connection that's being established, so uh, there's no way to uh, guarantee that your data is being received on your reader side.
Now you can use standard protocols for network communication. Next, we will verify correct application behavior on an RTVI using standard debugging tools.